record it. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the April 2021 edition of the St. Louis Java Users Group. The St. Louis Java Users Group uh, is an informal group. Attendance is free. We, we really don't have a formal membership list or anything like that. Our normal meeting date is the second Thursday of every month except December when we have no meeting. There's just too much going on during the holidays for us to be able to schedule a meeting then. Due to the pandemic, we are meeting online until further notice. But when we do meet in person, uh, we have people come and join us for food and social at 6 p.m. And the presentation itself, we try to start somewhere around 6.30. When we do meet in person, our meeting location is in the Object Computing Incorporated training room at 12,140 Woodcrest Executive Drive, Suite 310 in St. Louis, Missouri. I'd like to introduce everyone to the rest of the members of our steering committee. So from left to right here, we have Ted Doyle, Todd Zimmerman, Bruce Allspaw, that's me in the middle, Wei Chi Gao, and Kathy Swang. If you'd like to reach the steering committee, uh, the best way to do it is to just send an email to that address there at the bottom of the slide. That's chavasigsc at ociweb.com because they're an original sponsor of us and uh, it will go to all of us on the steering committee if you just send to that little group address right there. The St. Louis Java Users Group would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. So our founding sponsor was and continues to be Object Computing Incorporated and they're based in St. Louis and they donate the training room and fill in like if we might, might need pizza or maybe a speaker at the last minute or something like that. And they've been doing that, I believe going back all the way to approximately 1997. So we're approaching a 25th anniversary here before too long. JFrog has been very kind because not only are they sponsoring this Zoom account, which we are using to deliver the presentation to you here tonight, but they also sponsor the meetup group feeds. It's free for you if you want to attend one of our meetings on meetup, and you'll find us at meetup.com slash gateway chart, but it does cost the group to be able to have the page on Meetup and make it available. And they've been trying to cover that cost. When we meet in person, we have two uh, companies that alternate that cover the food, and that's Signature Consultants and Adaptive Solutions Group. So they're headhunters. If you are looking for a job or position, you can just look them up on the web and tell them that uh, you found out about them through the St. Louis Java Users Group and they can help you find a position or if you have a position that you need to fill, they would be a, a good place to start. At the end of this presentation, we will be raffling two JetBrains licenses. Yes, you must be present to win. Sorry, if you're watching the recording, you're too late. But stick around after the presentation and we'll do a we'll do a raffle here online. When we meet in person, Elastic is sponsoring some gift cards. We haven't figured out a way to send those electronically. They are physically plastic cards. Uh, but when, when we get out of this pandemic, we'll, we'll bring that back for the raffle, as well as the Intertech Monkeys. Intertech is a training company and they sponsor the famous Screaming Flying Monkeys, coffee cups and uh, mouse pads and so forth for the, for the raffle. Those Screaming Flying Monkeys, if you don't know, if you're just watching the recording because you're from, I don't know, halfway across the world, is basically they're just little dolls and you pull the string. When you throw the monkey up against the wall, it screams and they're a lot of fun. 
We will also be raffling at the end of this meeting two Manning ebooks of your choice. So that will be at the raffle at the end of the show. And also, when we have them, uh, Pearson uh, sponsors physical books uh, on occasion. So we really appreciate the support of our, our sponsors. Now, as far as upcoming presentations, on May 13th, we have Reactive Microservices with Spring Boot and Jay Hipster by Matt Rayable of Octo. So we just haven't had a Spring Boot presentation for a while. And hey, microservices, that's kind of hot. And what's this Jay Hipster? So yeah, when I saw that title, I said, I think I'm gonna go for it. This was one that was on the Fuji.io tour <laughs> that I nabbed uh, from last time because somebody didn't grab it. And so he accepted here within a few minutes and I'm just really happy uh, to have. So you can watch meetup.com slash gateway chart for updates to the presentation schedule and location. So we're still online uh, until further notice, but just watch the meetup group. It'll be clearly marked when we go back to in-person. I don't have any special knowledge or anything about when that's gonna be. But if you are interested in giving a presentation or sponsoring the chart, uh, just give us an email javasigsc at ociweb.com. We're always looking for speakers and we'll see what we can do uh, to get you worked in here. So I believe I, what I'd like to do is to hand things over here for just a moment before I hand it over here to our speaker tonight, Melissa. Ari, I think, of JFrog has some uh, uh, some things he'd like to tell us and some some raffle items. So I'm going to click over here to make you a host. And with great power comes great responsibility. I'll, I'll trust you to take it over and then hand it over to Melissa. So take it away, Ari. I will definitely do that. You know, Bruce, I just think I figured you out. You know, all the times I've known you, I, I, I realize you are a, you mentioned, when you said the word headhunter earlier about the companies, yeah. you are a, you are a headhunter of speakers because I said the, the passion behind how you obtain the speaker and how you share that is, is something I can tell you. You're a natural uh, at, at, at that and uh, could probably apply that to the technical recruiting space. Uh, I used to take <laughs> that space. Well, Frank, I would have hired you. So. Uh, anyway. <laughs> well, 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 thank you, Ari. Uh, I think I have maybe a different perspective on myself, and that is I'm a total scrounge when it ah. comes to speakers. I just go to the conferences, yeah, and I just I'm just right up front about it. I am totally honest. I'm here to steal your speaker. You're a networker. It's yeah. a good thing. Always... And, and, and I don't want to give too much away. I think I can. Okay, this is, no, this, is, this is only on video. It's okay. This no is one. only on video and it's only going to be broadcast all over the world. Exactly. I think I got a connection for our 25th anniversary. There you go. Maybe. No promises. Gotcha. No well, when you're ready promises. for. When you yeah, are ready. Gosling. When you're ready for a hello Gosling. world uh, in Java, you can just call me because that's, that's, that's about the talk I could give. But uh, hey, thank you, thank you again, Bruce. Really appreciate it. Again, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ari Waller, and I am the Meetup Event Manager for JFrog, and we are really excited to be a sponsor for the St. Louis uh, Jug for yet another year. I'll just share a little bit about who we are. Uh, JFrog is the DevOps software company founded in 2008. Many people in the DevOps community know us best for our flagship product, Artifactory, which is written in Java and which is considered by many to be the gold standard for managing your artifacts and dependencies. But here's something that you may not know. JFrog has a new free cloud version of our software available for you to use for your projects, especially for the Java meetup community. And if you're working with Docker, as I know many of you are, JFrog's free tier on the cloud is capable of functioning as a pull-through cache for Docker Hub. And here's the best part. Since JFrog has partnered with Docker, 
you'll be exempt from any rate limits on pulls from free or anonymous accounts. So that of course can be pretty valuable. Um, I'm going to share a slide with you. Let's see if let's see if the let's see if the transfer of hosts worked, and it looks like it did. Um, and I want to tell you about a couple other free things that we have going on, um, and that is our annual DevOps Global Conference Swamp Up 2021 is coming May 25th through 27th in the Americas, and June 1st and through the 3rd in uh, EMEA. And JFrog wants you to get in for free. Uh, here on the slide, or uh, uh, on the left, there, there's, um, we have a QR code that you can scan, and I'm going to drop the link in the chat as well, that automatically fills in a code for a free conference day. Now, the, the second day of the conference is free, but we have a third conference day that does cost money, but for the St. Louis Jug, um, when you um, click on the link I'm going to drop or use that QR scan, um, it's actually going to fill in a code which will allow you to add the third day, which is a deep dive tutorial day, um, into um, which is really in-depth technical two-hour uh, demos um, on lots of different products, not just JFrog products, but a ton of different partner products and so forth, which should be really, really cool. So um, we'd love to have you at that conference. And last, but certainly not least, another bonus for tonight is our raffle just for attendees tonight. JFrog is going to give you a chance to enter and win an Amazon Echo Show 5 or possibly one of the five limited edition t-shirts um, that uh, we have. If you've seen a JFrog t-shirt before, you already know you want one. And if you have one, you don't want another. So you can enter with the QR code and the bit.ly link that you see. And um, a winner, I wish I could do live drawings, but I've got compliance items that I have to be um, concerned about through corporate, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm gonna do is we do a random drawing within two days of the meetup. And then I contact the winner by email. After I've had my correspondence with them, I will announce the winner to your, um, to your meetup community and congratulate you on social. And with that, I am going to now turn it over to, um, Melissa, but Bruce and team, thank you so much. Uh, really, I, it, you know, with all that aside, um, what we can really tell is that a lot of time and attention to the details of your meetup and your community are really, really important to you. And that, and that, and, and that's really, really critical, especially when you want to put something good together. Um, and uh, I can't tell you that I know the community appreciates it, but from one who sits in um, quite a few meetups uh, every single day, in fact. I would say that you guys really, really have a knack for this. So kudos to, to all of you and thank you very much. So I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'm gonna turn this over to, I'm gonna turn the hosting over to Melissa so she can in fact share her stuff. And I keep do, pushing the wrong button. You think if I sat in enough of these, I would be able to do this correctly. So let me just do this correct here. All right, sorry for the delay. Melissa, you are now the host. Thank you. Excellent. I'm feeling super important right now. I've got control. All right. You should be able to see my screen now. I can see it. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I'm Melissa McKay. I'm a developer advocate with JFrog, and I'm super excited to be here to talk to you all tonight about containers. Um, this is a talk I've given a few times now, and I really enjoy it. I hope you do too. And just to set some expectations up front, there is a lot of information about Docker in this talk, but this is not a tutorial or a deep dive on Docker commands or anything like that. There's already a ton of documentation out there already on that. So when I put this talk together, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do some background research and focus more on how we got here and get to some answers to some of those big why questions, why we're even doing any of this. My hope is that after this talk, you'll come away with a better understanding of the history behind containers, how they actually work on your system, and some of what is really going on under the covers. Um, for those of you that are really experienced with containers already, a lot of this might be a review, but I promise there's going to be something in here that you'll be able to get from, from this talk. There's a lot of little details. All right. 
Okay, I'm not going to linger on this too long because Ari's spoken about this already, but don't forget to um, go to this link and to fill out uh, feedback and um, enter to win your Amazon show. Um, this is also where I will post slides um, for you to refer to later if you like. Um, I'll show this again at the end in case you want to grab the link again. We're all over that. <laughs> Okay, uh, a little bit about where I come from. My back where, background in software engineering and development, um, I, I've, I've been a Java developer um, for many, many years. I've been a developer in some way, shape or form now for over 20 years. So um, most of my professional experience has been in server side development in Java, but I've had the privilege of working on many different teams over the years in a variety of different technologies, languages, and different tool sets. I started speaking a few years ago. I decided that was something I wanted to do more of. So I made the jump to developer relations with uh, JFrog last February. Uh, I just celebrated my year anniversary. Uh, that has been a whole new experience, especially since uh, normally with this position, you travel a lot. <laughs> And we have uh, learned very quickly how to uh, enjoy ourselves online with these new online conference frameworks. And it's, it's actually been a good experience for me. I've, I've met a completely different audience. Um, a lot of people who, for one reason or another, family obligations or work obligations, I wouldn't normally see them at a conference. So I, I've really enjoyed this experience and I hope that as we move forward here that, that we're gonna have a variety of both in-person and online stuff that people can attend. My most recent experience in software development pushed me into some new territory. And this was while I started working on teams that were beginning to practice DevOps. And this is when I got the privilege to learn more about how the apps I was working on were actually being deployed. And um, I got a lot of exposure to a variety of tools in the DevOps ecosystem, which makes you know, the move to JFrog just perfect. But anyway, it was during this experience that I was exposed to Docker. And that's how I, this talk came about. I started collecting information from my own experience and um, you know, learning how to containerize my apps and some of it trial and error, which we'll get to talk to a little bit later. All right, um, let's get started. We'll begin with a brief history here to uh, give some background context. This hopefully won't be too boring, but there are some really important milestones in the past that are good to know to get a better understanding of how we got here. Then we'll take a look at the container market and what's been going on there for the last few years. And then we'll move into getting a real understanding of what Docker is. Docker is not synonymous with containers. It's also a very overused term, uh, much like Kleenex is. After that, we'll be in an excellent place to talk about what a container actually is. And then we'll review a few common container gotchas. And last but not least, I'll talk to you a little bit about an option for managing your container images. All right, a uh, few reasons why I just wanna show you this list. Um, I know if you haven't considered this before, and I, I know that a lot of folks aren't really using containers yet in production, but there are lots of reasons to use them outside of production. Um, the top two are listed here um, to provide consistent development environments uh, for your local environments, for your developers, or also to use in testing our QA environments where you can still gauge the quality of your application with significantly less resources than a production environment. So just um, keep in mind, um, this isn't all about production deploy. You can definitely take advantage of this methodology in other, other environments. All right, let's jump in and start learning about containers. So I'm pretty sure this isn't the graphic that you were expecting. Usually you see a classic shipping container photo of some shape or form. So uh, first and foremost, um, one reason that I'm, I'm just tired of seeing shipping containers on every presentation about Docker or containerization in general. So I've started a rebellion and I'm going with the banana theme. And I uh, hope you'll enjoy that theme throughout this talk. Um, second reason I chose this is this is really a story about how our industry has adapted to dealing with limited resources over time. 
When I was putting these slides together, I was reminded of a story that my grandfather would repeatedly tell me when I was growing up, um, surely just to remind me to be grateful for what we have today. When he was a kid, he would get a single banana once a year on Christmas. And this must have been during the 20s and early 30s. Bananas were a rare treat during that time for my grandfather's family, and none of that banana would go to waste. In fact, he and his siblings would scrape the banana peel to get every last bit off because they wouldn't get another one until the next year. That's not the most solid analogy, but I, I went with it. And um, I liken that story to how computing resources were in the 1960s and 70s, very limited, very expensive. And on top of that, it took forever to get anything done. Often a computer would be dedicated for a long period of time to a single task for a single user. Obviously, these limits and on time and resources uh, created some bottlenecks and inefficiency. And just being able to share was not enough. There needed to be a method to share without getting in each other's way or having one person inadvertently causing an entire system to crash for everyone. At this need for better strategies in sharing compute resources actually started a path of innovation that we see massive benefits from today. Then there's some key points here that I wanna share with you uh, that brought us to this state that we're in today with containers. And I'm gonna begin this history lesson with Chirut. Chirut was born in 1979 during the development of the seventh edition of Unix and was added to BSD the Berkeley software distribution in 1982. Being able to change the apparent root directory for a process and its children, which Chirut allows you to do, results in a bit of isolation in order to provide an environment for testing a different distribution, for example. Chirut was a great idea, solved some specific problems, but more was needed. The jail command was introduced by FreeBSD in 2000. Jail is more sophisticated than Chirut in that its additional features help to further isolate file systems, users, and networks with the ability also to assign an IP address to each jail. In 2004, Solaris Zones brought us ahead even further by giving an application full user process and file system space and access to system hardware. Solaris Zones also introduced the idea of being able to snapshot a system. In 2006, Google jumped in there with their process containers, uh, later renamed C groups. Those center around isolating and limiting the resource usage of a process. And moving right along in 2008, C groups were merged into the Linux kernel, which along with Linux namespaces, led to IBM's development of Linux containers. 2013 was a big year. This is when Docker came on the scene, bringing their ability to package these containers and move them from one environment to another. That same year, Google open sourced their Let Me Container That For You project, which provided applications the ability to create and manage their own sub-containers. And from here on out, we saw the use of containers and um, specifically Docker explode. Um, I love this part because uh, containers have been around for a long time, the idea of containers. Uh, this is not new stuff, it's just packaged differently. And Docker took advantage of that and succeeded. In 2014, Docker chose, out, chose to swap out their use of the LXC toolset for launching containers with libcontainer in order to utilize a native Golang solution. That was something new that I didn't realize is that um, their libcontainer was, was written in Golang. All right, I'm almost done, I promise. This is a very busy slide. Um, skipping over some details here around different projects organizations and other specs that came out, because I want to get what, to what happened in June of 2015. This event is important to know about because it will give you some insight into some of the activity and motivations behind the shifts in the market. The Open Container Initiative was established, which is an organization under the Linux Foundation that includes members from many major stakeholders, including Docker, 
with the goal of creating open standards for container runtimes and image specification. While all of this is happening in the container world, there's a couple of other dates that are going to be important to us Java devs to know specifically. The first is that Java 7 was released in July of 2011 and work was started on Java 8, which was released in March of 2014. Keep this in mind because when you start containerizing your Java applications, this little bit of history will be important to know. And I'll be bringing this up again later. All right, that's it for history. Uh, let's move on to the container market and what's going on there. I did a little hunting and found that for the last three years, well, several years actually, Sysdig, a company that provides a really powerful monitoring and troubleshooting tool for Linux, some of you may already be using this tool, uh, they put out a container report based on the analysis of their users. And part of the report includes data on container runtimes that are in use. In 2017, they analyzed data from 45,000 containers. Um, in the huge scope of things, that isn't very many, but we got to start somewhere. There's no graph here available because 99% of those containers were Docker. So they didn't even split up the results. In 2018, however, they analyzed data from 90,000 containers, double their sample size. We're getting somewhere. 83% were Docker. And then we see, you know, other percentages for CoreOS Rocket, Mesos, and LXC. So it looks like other container runtimes are starting to encroach a little bit on the Docker space. Moving on to 2019, now we've got some numbers we can work with. The Sysdig container report included stats from over 2 million containers. And Docker is still holding relatively strong at 79%. 18% container D, but uh, it's worth noting that container D is actually a runtime that Docker builds on top of. That last percent, 4% uh, four, four is cryo. And uh, this data is interesting, especially because of what's been happening over the last few years. Um, something um, to note here is that disappearance of CoreOS Rocket. That's kind of a sad story. <laughs> CoreOS was required by Red Hat at the beginning of 2018. And prior to that, Rocket was accepted to the CNCF. That's the Cloud Native Computing Foundation as an incubating project. And it really looked like a promising competitor, competitor to Docker's Container D. Um, their approach to security, for example, was a little bit different and, and favored. However, since that acquisition, the development of the project went dormant, and in mid-2019, mid Rocket was archived by the CNCF, and in February of 2020, the project was ended. All right, uh, the last report just came out in January. This is their 2021 Container Security and Usage Report. And it's hard to know if we're comparing apples to apples here, considering that little qualifier of a subset of customer containers. But this report includes a ton of detailed information about their demographics and data sources, as well as other interesting information around what services customers are running, like Kubernetes, as well as you know, what they're using for orchestration. Um, I put the link here to this report, so uh, when you get a moment and you're curious, it's definitely worth taking a look at. There's a lot of information in there. But in a nutshell, what I pulled from it was this. I noticed that increase in usage of Container D from 18% in the previous report to 33%. It'll be really interesting to see if that trend continues, especially since Kubernetes announced they will be deprecating support for Docker as a runtime later this year. Um, some of you might have questions about that, but um, that's nothing to panic over. Um, all that means is that um, you can't use Docker as a runtime in Kubernetes. They won't be supporting that anymore, but the images that you create with Docker, those are still compatible. You can still use them. You just have to switch out the runtime. All right, now that I've introduced a few of these other container runtimes uh, that exist out there besides Docker, it's time to start talking about what a container actually is and what Docker actually provides in order to appreciate those differences. 
you momentarily speak to the commonalities between these containers as well because of the open specification and how there is a unified idea of what each of these containers are now providing and therefore the Kleenex will survive as a container yes. and therefore the differences between all three of these that you have mentioned becomes moot. If exactly. anything, the specification that Docker will no longer as a as a trial example, not have to run as root becomes a large hurdle to give its popularity back. Right, that's exactly correct. All right, so let's get into talking about what Docker is exactly. And this is a key point. What Docker had over other players in the container game was a focus on commoditizing a complete solution that made it easy for developers to package and deploy their applications. And once containers became easy to use, we all witnessed that explosion of tools and resources around containers and the Docker image format rose to become a de facto standard in the market. And the stats that I just showed from Sysdig are specific to container runtimes. That terminology is important to understand here. And I'll explain those pieces and parts involved in working with containers. And you'll immediately understand why Docker was able to suck up this market so quickly. And as you mentioned, why I don't think they're going away anytime soon. <laughs> All right. As users, let's think about what we actually need to get our apps out there and running. Often we can find ourselves getting so far down into nitty gritty details that we lose sight of the actual problem we are trying to solve. That reminds me of my first job as an intern. I had an amazing boss. And whenever um, I started to overthink something or stumble around to make a decision, he would always come out with this advice. Always go back to the original problem you are trying to solve. Ask yourself if the move you wanna make is getting you further or closer to solving that problem. And I use that advice to this day. So here's a list of needs that are broken up into discrete features. First and foremost, we need that container itself. And some of you might be asking about uh, virtual machines, VMs at this point. Um, I just had someone the other day um, think, you know, they, they said, well, VMs are the same thing as containers. And, and we had a long conversation. I was pretty raw <laughs> after that. But um, <laughs> Um, discussing VMs, it, we're not going to do that too much during this session, but the one thing that I'll say uh, about it is they're not the same thing as a container. Uh, the biggest difference being that a VM is usually understood to include an entire OS all to itself, and containers actually share the systems OS. The point of the container is to be lightweight and have the ability to move from one environment to another seamlessly and quickly. That said, I know there's, there are some developments happening in the VM space, but that's a topic for another time. So the rest of this list, uh, we need an image format to define a container. We need a method of building an image of a container, and we need a way to manage um, images. We need a way to distribute and share those images, and we need a way to create, launch, and run a container environment we also need a way to manage the life cycle of the running containers. And I didn't even get into orchestration or anything like that. This right here is plenty to prove my point about Docker. So in the context of those developer needs that we just went through, Docker was ready for an answer for everything. You wanna start using containers? Well, we have Docker engine for you. You need an image format? Well, here's the Docker image format. You need a way to build an image. Sure, we've, we've got, uh, you can use a Docker file. Um, just call the command Docker build. You wanna manage those images, call Docker images or Docker RM for remove. You wanna share your images or use an image from someone else, call Docker push, Docker pull. Oh, and there's Docker hub where you can store and share your images. If you need a way to launch, run, and manage your containers in their life cycle, you've got Docker Run, Docker Stop, Docker PS. Docker quickly succeeded in meeting the immediate needs of our container hungry market. And on top of that, the tool sets that Docker provided made it all easy, a huge plus for developers. And that was a huge, tremendous part 
of the market share that they were able to walk away with. All right, now we're gonna get into these pieces and parts. And nomenclature here is very important. Um, differences between images, runtime, engines, all of that stuff matters. Um, remember in our history lesson when I spoke about the open container initiative, out of all of those features that we just discussed that Docker offers, there were two that were taken up for the cause by the OCI, the image format and the container runtime. They actually also offered up distribution, but I'm gonna stick with these two for now. Docker did quite a bit of reorganizing their code base, developing extractions and pulling out discrete functionality. They are a heavy contributor to the OCI. Um, they actually gave the Docker version two image spec as a basis for the OCI image spec. They also gave run C, which was a contributed as a reference implementation of the OCI container runtime spec. There's a, quite a few other container runtimes you might see out there, including container D. Remember, this is one that um, Docker uses. Cryo and Kata are other options, all with various levels of features for specific use cases. Um, again, about Docker building on top of container D, uh, container D was actually contributed by Docker to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it itself internally uses run C. Container D was integrated into Docker and has been in use since version 1.11, which came out in 2016. So that's old news. It's been a while now. The next few years, I think are gonna be really interesting to observe what happens with these specs and how the OCI moves forward. There's uh, quite a range of differing opinions about what should and should not be in the standard for a container runtime. And we're in a situation where having a runtime that just meets the requirements of the OCI spec doesn't seem to be enough to drive adoption. I've added a couple of links here that are excellent starting places to learn more about computer runtimes or container runtimes, if you're curious. Uh, that second one in particular is the beginning of a blog series by Ian Lewis. He's a Google Dev Advocate. The first subtitle in that blog was called Why Are Container Runtimes So Confusing, which immediately attracted me when I was looking into this. Uh, Ian does a, a really good job of explaining some of this, and he goes into details about low-level and high-level runtimes and where they might overlap, which causes some of our confusion. All right, what if you don't want to use Docker? That's fine. You might want to sit yourself down and ask why not. <laughs> Maybe it's that long running daemon, the Docker daemon. Um, there could be reasons you don't want that. Uh, maybe you just want to stop thinking that Docker is all there is, and um, we really need to stop calling all containers Docker containers because it's not really true. Uh, maybe you want to build your own images using a bash script. You just want to do it all yourself because you certainly can. It's, it's not magic. You can definitely do that. Um, there are these other projects out there. Um, Podman, usually you use that to run containers. Um, Builda, use that to build images. Um, Scopio can be used to transfer container images from remote repositories. Um, there's a, a couple of other projects I don't list on this slide. Um, Bazel is a Google tool. Uh, Kenico is another Google tool. Uh, those two I have not used, so I will not comment on them, but I think it's, it's interesting that um, with the open specs and stuff, we're going to see more tool sets come out there. Some of the cons here right away is um, these aren't really convenient to run on a Mac, Mac OS or Windows OS, so if that's what your development environment is, then you might just stick with Docker. Um, also, like Podman Machine, that's that's an option to maybe you know get that running on your Mac, for example. But it still requires a Linux VM. Um, also, oh, something I didn't put on this slide as well is Jib. I'm curious how many of you have used Jib and what your experience is with that. Um, I'll bring that up again a little bit later when we we talk about some of the um, some of the gotchas. 
that you can get into when you're building a, a Docker file. And um, if, if I forget to bring this up again, um, definitely ask me afterwards. But um, I'm going to just post the jib link to our chat since I don't have it on the slide. Um, but it, it's a good one to go, go check out. Um, mainly, the, the biggest point with them is they optimize your images. Um, you don't need the Docker daemon. And um, the way they optimize the images is, um, you know, normally you, you might see uh, your whole Java app be in a single layer, and they actually uh, break it up into multiple layers. So it's a little bit more efficient. All right, moving on. Now that we understand all that Docker entails, that it's an entire tech stack, not just one thing. Um, and also some of what's going on in the market. Let's focus on just what the container itself is and what that looks like on your system. I'll show you how it's stored and what's actually happening under the covers there. And um, you'll discover, like I said before, that it's, it's not magic. So my first experience with containers, it's been several years now, but um, I was a developer on a, on a, new, a new team, new project. Uh, there was a tight deadline, of course, that can, that can be a good description of most teams <laughs> and most projects. Um, the best course of action for me in general is just to jump in and start getting something up and running on my local machine. I learned best by doing. So um, the Docker documentation that I came across is actually, it was good then, it's really good now. So if you find yourself in a similar position, I recommend going through their Get Started Docs. I've linked those here on the slide. And going through this guide will get you comfortable with all of the Docker commands you're going to need. Um, the ones I had on a previous slide, those are just the bare minimum. Um, there's a lot that you can do. Um, the first thing to note is that a Docker image is really just a tarball of a complete file system. And when an image is unpacked, it's just thrown into its own directory, which becomes its root file system. The second is that the processes that are involved in running the containers are just regular Linux processes. And on top of that, there's just a few Linux features that are used together in a way to achieve that isolation that we want from containers. Namespaces are an important ingredient because this is what is used to provide that virtual separation between containers. This is how the processes inside a container don't interfere with the host or processes inside another container on the same host. Here you can see the namespaces that were set up for a Postgres container that I have on my box. Stop here for a moment and speak to the fact. This is the area where run C has failed and those security issues that have been noted because of Docker have been alleviated most part. And this is why Podman was developed to actually speak to the fact that when you run Docker in its native form, it's running as root. And this is one of the security flaws of why alternatives came out and why the uh, Open Container Initiative was created to actually speak to these issues to allow a better isolation by not running as root. Also, there are alternatives that are using JIB that should be considered because there are successors out there currently right now called JCube. I will put a link into the chat. Awesome, thank you. It's definitely worth checking out. All right, the C groups functionality. It, that Those are essential to constraining how much a container can use things like CPU, memory, network bandwidth, et cetera. And um, I, you can see that I've set uh, these constraints by including options on the Docker run command. Um, you can do that when launching an image. Uh, here, you can see that I've constrained the memory usage limit on one of my containers. All right, I'm gonna quickly gloss over some file system details. Uh, where containers and images are actually stored on your file system. I went digging around one day just just to satisfy my own curiosity on you know, how my file system on my local machine is actually changing 
when I'm building these images, running these containers, all of that stuff. Um, part of it was because something was broken and I just needed to figure out how to clean it up. So um, this, was, this was quite the deep dive. Anyway, um, first off, after you've installed Docker, assuming that's what you're using and not something else, uh, running the Docker info will spit out a bunch of information about your installation, including the Docker root directory. This is where most everything you're going to care about regarding your Docker images and containers will be stored. And note that if you're on a Mac, your containers are actually running in a tiny VM. So you're going to need some tool like screen or something to get in there and get to the Docker root directory to look around. If you're not familiar with that tool, with the screen command, for example, definitely Google that um, in advance, get familiar with it first. It will mess up your text display pretty good on the Mac if you don't enter and exit it appropriately. This slide shows how you can get information about the images that you have stored on your system. First, I listed my available images using the Docker images command. I actually have several installed, but I'm just showing you the first couple in the list. Using the Docker inspect command, I can expect any image I like using its image ID. This will spit out a ton of interesting information. But what I want to highlight here is the graph driver section, which contains the paths to the directories where all of those layers that belong to this image live. Docker images are composed of layers, which represent instructions in the Docker file that was used to build the image originally. These layers actually translate into directories, these, and they can be shared across um, other images in order to save space. Pretty clever. The lower dir, merge dir, and upper dir sections, I want to highlight here. The lower dir directory contains all of the directories or layers, like we just learned, that were used to build the original image. And these are read only. The upper dir directory contains all of the content that has been modified while the container is running. If modifications are needed for that read only layer in lower dir, then that layer is copied into the upper dir where it can be written to. And you may have heard the term copy on write operation. That's what that is. It's important to remember that that data that's in upper dir is ephemeral data. It only lives as long as the container lives. In fact, if you have any data that you intend to keep, you should utilize the volume features of Docker um, and mount a location that will stick around after that container dies. And this is how um, most containers handle running a database, by the way. Lastly, the merge dir is kind of like a virtual directory that combines everything from lower dir and upper dir. And the way the union file system works is that any edited layers that were copied into upper dir will overlay the layers in the lower dir. And that's what you see when you get into your container. All right, I actually have a few containers currently running on my system. Two of them are my local JFrog container registry installation, which includes a container for Artifactory and a container for a Postgres database. The other is a simple test container I was playing around with. And note that the container IDs of the running containers match up with the container subdirectory names. Something to remember here is if you stop the container, that corresponding directory doesn't automatically go away until the container is actually removed with the docker rm command or some other method. So if you have stopped containers that are lying around and they never get cleaned up, you might see your available space start to dwindle. There is a uh, docker system prune command. You can run that every now and then to help clean things up, or you can launch a container with a flag to indicate that it should be removed when it's finished running. A lot of orchestration systems like Kubernetes can handle this part for you. Um, just important to know about it, especially when you're developing on your local box. Okay, now we're moving on into gotchas. These tool sets around building and running images and containers have made things so easy, it's also easy to shoot yourself in the foot in a few places. And I'm gonna go over some of the most common gotchas here, including some JVM specific ones that I ran into immediately when I first started working with containers. 
The first is running a containerized application as the root user. And I'll be totally honest here. Um, when I was initially getting containers up and running, I was just so excited about how well it was working that it was a while before I took it seriously. Now that I know that processes inside a running container are just like any other processes on the system, albeit a few constraints, it's pretty scary now to run as root inside a container. And doing that opens up the possibility of a process escaping the intended confines of the container and uh, gaining access to host resources. Uh, the idea here is to reduce the tax surface of your container by following the principle of least privilege. Although containers are designed not to affect other running containers, if someone were to gain access to your container and immediately has root privileges, they can wreak havoc on your host. So how do we mitigate this problem? The best thing to do is to uh, create a user and use the user command inside the Docker file when the container is built in order to run processes as that user. There is a way that you can specify a user when, the doc when you uh, use the Docker run command, but that leaves, you can like pass it in as a flag, but that leaves open the possibility of forgetting to do that. Uh, it happens. And it's, it's just nice if the image itself is set up by, by default not to run as root. So pay attention to all of those official images that you pull down from Docker Hub, uh, whether or not they run as root or if they leave that up to you to figure out. Um, some of them are you know, really handy, but what I, uh, what I see generally as a pattern is, um, especially within companies that have you know, better control over that, uh, they will pull down you know, official images from Docker Hub, but then they will modify, you know, make modifications using a, a user that everyone is aware of, and they will create that image. And then that image is what's used as the base or uh, the parent image of anything else in the company. All right, even though Docker provides you with the ability to set some resource limits on your, on your container, it does not automatically do that for you. In fact, the default settings are pretty much a free for all with no limits anywhere. So make sure that you understand the resource needs of your application. Too little, your container will die from starvation and too much and the container could smother others on the system. Um, so using containers, although very convenient, it is not a license to be lazy and not understand the resource, um, your usage of your application. Uh, that's something also that you're going to want to monitor over time and adjust as needed just like your Java applications before. Uh, it's a very good way to determine if something is going wrong or if load on your system has changed for some reason. Uh, you can also use that information to determine if your application needs to be split up further with certain actions scaled differently. Never updating. This is a huge security issue. And it's very easy to get complacent and not pay attention to what is actually being pulled in when you build images. Not only do you need to be aware of outdated versions that you specify in your own Docker file, but you also need to pay attention to what's in the base image that it's coming from. Not updating those packages and libraries inside your container, those can lead to some pretty embarrassing results, especially when there are tools available now to alert you when security issues have been discovered with specific artifacts. Um, even ensuring that you're running containers with a non-privileged user, even that has a risk when there are known vulnerabilities that exist within your container or even on the kernel of the host. Uh, from time to time, exploits are found that enable attackers to potentially escape a container. Uh, we know it happens. Uh, it's not something that you can always prevent. So definitely have a process in place to respond to those events and regularly update your package packages. Keep up with those security updates. Should I've definitely come up been- with a strategy. Should you come up with a strategy of coming up with a list of base approved images to start with so that at Absolutely. least your brownest banana doesn't look that bad? Exactly. That's an, that's an excellent idea. And I've seen that um, before where like you might, you might get a, you know, an, an, 
an image from Docker Hub that everyone uses, right? But then internally, you update it and you um, use that image as a base image internally. It's a very good, very good strategy to have. And um, you can organize your base images um, pretty well that way. Um, I, yeah, not updating, that's common too. I've also seen that. Um, if it hasn't been a priority, it's usually because of the fear of breaking a product or service that, that's already working. Um, but in reality, that's a symptom of a different problem <laughs> and it's just not worth it. It's um, much worse to leak private data or potentially be the start of a domino effect that can bring an entire system down uh, rather than you know, take the time and come up with that strategy and update your stuff. All right, this one's fun. I don't know how you feel about that graphic, but it's really just about something unexpected. Um, this is Java specific, very specific to containerizing Java applications and very much related to being aware of what your application requires to run successfully regarding memory. That JVM is pretty clever at automatically determining settings for your swap and heap and your garbage collection and all that lovely stuff. Uh, based on things like the memory and the number of cores available on the host. And remember earlier during our history lesson when I mentioned the dates for Java 7 and Java 8. Java 7 was released in July of 2011. Work was started on Java 8 in March of 2014. So considering that timeline of Docker uh, developments and Java releases, Java 7 and earlier versions of 8 and certainly earlier versions, are not fully container aware. This means that your Java application won't necessarily obey those memory and CPU constraints that you put on your container. You may end up with some surprise out of memory killer activity if you aren't paying attention to that. The reason for that is that the mechanisms the JVM used in these older versions to retrieve the resources available those came from the actual host machine and not the C group limits that you would expect. There were some improvements around container awareness that were introduced in Java 8, um, update 131 specifically, and further improvements in later versions and some backporting going on. But to really get all of the benefits of container awareness, you really should get to Java 11, the latest LTS release that is container aware. All right, container gotchas and image bloat. Um, something I see a lot, pulling in large parent or base images that include a bunch of stuff you don't need. That increases your attack surface area from a security perspective. And shipping these large images around and storing them can become clumsy, slow, and expensive now since we're paying for all of our storage in the cloud <laughs> these days. Um, start with making use of the dot docker ignore file. So it's very similar to the git ignore file. Um, use that to keep those unnecessary items out of your images. I've also seen in build, you know, docker files that are being built. Sometimes I see like a one line copy of an entire source tree into the image. And there's actually multiple problems there. You are, you know, including tests, maybe a test directory or something that you, you really don't need. Um, also that if you do that in one line, that's an entire layer with all of your stuff. And if anything ever changes, which it will with every check-in, that layer has to be regenerated every build. So organize your code so that stuff changes, the stuff that changes the most often is in its own layer. Um, think implementations versus abstractions. And um, that's that's where Jib comes in that you know kind of handles that for you a little bit. Another um, thing that I've seen is is mistakenly including the git directory even. Um, obviously that's not a good idea to include in your image. Um, you could possibly be including secrets. And even if you take the step to delete specific things after that copy, it still lives in that previous layer stored on the machine. You may not see it, but it's still there. 
Um, that said, if you're pulling your Java source into the Docker file, you're likely including your build tool as well, like Maven or Gradle. Um, learn to use, utilize the Docker multi-stage Docker build. So you don't end up with all of that craft, all of those extras in your production image. And this problem is certainly not limited to Java projects. I've seen it um, with other code bases as well. All right, managing your images. This is important, more than you know. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about it, about pulling images from Docker Hub and stuff. Um, consider where your base and parent images are coming from. And if you're not specifying a container registry in your Docker file, by default, it is coming from Docker Hub. That's the default behavior. So um, if you want to only use the images that are provided by like an internal registry, you need to specify that internal registry. Um, proprietary images, you know, maybe you want to protect those and not just make those available to the general public. Make sure that you are putting those in a private registry that you have credentials for. Um, public registries like Docker Hub, they certainly have their purpose. They're an awesome place to share official images and get some of your services up and running um, quickly without starting from scratch. But I definitely highly recommend using a private internal container registry. Uh, this will help keep you um, reliable access to those required images for your builds. Um, you can avoid random failures in your pipelines because of network issues or a missing image due to a, you know, lost connection to the public registry. Uh, you also have better control, better access to uh, proprietary images. There are a ton of free tools out there. And of course, I'm going to um, point you to uh, the JFrog platform. And there's a link here that you can use and try out. Uh, you can um, store images there. It will proxy images from Docker Hub. Um, Ari mentioned it a little bit at the beginning as well. Pretty good stuff. Also, if you're new to container registries, uh, at the bottom of this slide is a link to a DZone rough card that'll help you learn a little bit more about the things that you should consider when you start setting up a container registry or choosing one to begin with. Um, what else here? Oh, the FUJ link. Uh, that's the last resource I'll talk about. When you build your images with a particular JDK, because you should, um, you wanna be, if you want more specifics on which version or update to use, Fuji.io is a great resource to help you compare those Java versions and get detailed info on updates. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Um, I will open for questions for sure. And um, I need to know who to share or make host <laughs> once we're done with questions. Be Ted, so that he should be right below. I'm sorry, who? He, that would be Ted. Oh, Ted, yeah, okay. He's, he's the one who normally handles the raffle there. But does anyone have any okay. questions here for Melissa? Wow, everybody's real quiet, okay. Well, I don't have any questions. I just thought it was a really good talk, very informative. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I really like the background, the uh, historical background as well. Yeah, I, I tried to um, work with uh, some source code. I got source code for a project and I tried to deploy it on my local machine and I didn't have any information about um, what the data, what, um, how to go about setting up the database, what the passes were, what the default tables were, all that sort of stuff. And I sort of said, oh, that's what containers are all about. So that you have the entire ecosystem of your, uh, your, 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 your system in there. And you don't have to worry about keeping track of passwords and all that because you got the the things that handle secrets and connecting with the database and and you know was it designed for which type of operating system was designed for and do you have the right packages installed and it just was like oh that's what our containers are all about so I'm like I'm in hearing it but I 
didn't sort of understand it. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yeah, they're pretty powerful. And um, something that I like to use, especially for like testing in QA environments and stuff, test containers. Very, very awesome project. If you aren't using that, uh, definitely take a look at that. Um, because you don't, you don't always want to set up, you know, a production grade database, for example, but you also don't want to use an in-memory database, which may be a little different in syntax or by, you know, the queries might be a little different than your actual database that you use in production. So um, definitely check out test containers um, that can make that process a lot easier on you. You know, talking about the, uh, the security of containers, that's something that's uh, really on my mind a lot lately. And one of the, the mantras I hear a lot in security is make it easy to do the right thing. And so what I've been thinking about or working towards is providing that base Docker template, that base Docker file that includes the creating the user that doesn't have the elevated access and, and providing that information for the other developers that you know, they're just trying to get through the Docker file to get their thing deployed. They don't really know it or understand it or maybe necessarily even care about it. But, you know, just make it easy for them to do the right thing and see that that last step copies everything over, puts it in the lower level access and sets it up. That's excellent, excellent advice. Um, you can definitely, yeah, narrow, you know, reduce your risk by bringing that all up top and have, you know, a team that are it handles that stuff um, because all it takes is one developer to push one change to a Docker file that can open you up for problems. So yeah, um, that's I, I like that um, sentence. You know, make it easy if you want it to be done correctly. Make it easy. Developers need things to be easy. <laughs> We're lazy. We just want to get this stuff done. One of the names that came up on one of the slides that I saw at the very beginning. His name is Matt Rabel. Mm -hmm. He is a great speaker about creating secure by design yep. and actually speaking about having managed containers in a Kubernetes environment. Yep. And one of the things is like, the developer is the person that you st should start with first. And there is something called the four C's that you can look up on Kubernetes website to actually look at the fact that how they on Kubernetes to talk about security. And mm -hmm. therefore, you have to come up with some way to use things like OpenID, OAuth, JWT, in concert with each other to actually have an OAuth provider, as an example, Heatcloth, that you would actually stick in your Kubernetes environment. And therefore, you would then control who has authority to talk to microservice A, to microservice B, to microservice C, and therefore, the key cloth is your OAuth provider that provides all of these things, the OpenID, the OAuth, as well as the JWT, and therefore then controls that type of orchestration of the microservices. When you then put this also with Istio, which is your service mesh, with yeah. Envoy on top of this, you have a totally locked down environment from a network perspective, along with authority inside of your Kubernetes environment. And if you really want to go to the nth degree and lock down your uh, cube control, put SHIPA on it, and therefore then you would have roles as well as users involved in your Kubernetes environment. These are the things that I think are the most important things that a developer, a developer, not an administrator, should actually learn as the tools that they should be implementing to stick into their environment to give a fully functional productionized version of what they should deliver. Yes. All right, three things. I'm, I'm just smiling as you're speaking. Um, Matt Rabel and I are good friends. He's actually here in Denver. I'm in Denver as well. And uh, we run DevOps for Kids together. And um, yes, and you have your um, next next meetup group with Matt. So you can start peppering him with questions for sure. Oh, um, I, awesome guy. I Amazing. love his talks. I <laughs> am a hilarious. big, big fan. I he love his VW the biggest van. person that I have ever <laughs> so funny. read about his and read about his slides, read about seeing what he puts on YouTube. He has the most important 
view of how to handle cloud native, and I do mean cloud native deployment of where you could go in this in these types of environments. And therefore, okay. if you containerize and stick it in Kubernetes and get it into a managed environment, the way I've described, I think that you can then find the lowest price that you want to go from AWS to Google to Azure or even yeah. IBM. Yeah, definitely. Um, second, I have a service mesh talk that I do. So yes, I enjoy talking about service mesh and all of the um, abilities that gives you, including the security. You know, no longer do you have to worry about anyone talking to your container or your service without going through that gatekeeper. And third, um, we have some swamp up talks around that very subject. So um, definitely consider taking a look at some of our swamp up sessions around that. Could you talk about that? Um, I'm, I do, I'm doing one with Shippa, actually. <laughs> I want debugging and visualization yes. for what I have described more, like Kali and other things that are available to in involve Envoy, because the fact like Envoy is not really representative enough to actually show the ingress and egress points of view that you need to have visibility so that when things go wrong in the middle of the night, you get a call, I'm sorry, you have yep. to, it's too hard to dig through and with all the commands and everything to find where the bug is. Right, exactly. Um, one suggestion, have you looked at Datadog's offerings at all? Um, they, have, they actually have a pretty amazing visualization tool that uh, lets you track you know, the communication between all of I your- I hate those who use the bad word, free? Oh, no, <laughs> unfortunately, no. <laughs> I, right now, no money is available for me to actually- <laughs> Gotcha, totally got it. Understood. Oh, here's something that's, that um, is free. <laughs> okay, um, and something that might, you, and, you know, some of you might find this useful. Um, the JFrog platform has a free service. Um, you can sign up for that. There's a link on this slide here for that. Um, part of that is a, a version of X-Ray, which monitors you know, all of your packages that you have that have been pulled into Artifactory there. It includes Artifactory as well. And um, it will you know, scan those packages and let you know about any known vulnerabilities. And on top of that, as a developer, you can actually include a plugin on um, all of the main IDEs. I use IntelliJ, love it. Um, and I just add the JFrog plugin. I set it up to communicate with my X-Ray and I can tell right there in my palm file when I'm ready to add a dependency, I can put that dependency in there and it'll let me know if there's any already known problems with it that I need to consider before even checking it in. Would that alleviate the issues that is my next issue is having a bill of materials to be published as part of the build of your container? Because right now, because Absolutely. of Solar Winds uh, Orion debugger yep. problem that got yes. in because um, I'm sorry, Microsoft that supply mail, chain attack. Ugh, because of <laughs> yeah. that fact has just turned my head upside down in the fact that now I can't trust bills. Now we have to have a completely virgin build that now has to be validated against the developer. So you have to build it in two places, once against a pure, once against the developer, and they must match by checksum. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, we definitely have that bill of materials. Um, you can use that for troubleshooting, you know, one build to the next. Um, also, if there's a vulnerability that's found inside a Docker image, there's actually a visualization that will go deep into the layers. It'll tell you exactly what layer has the problem and what package within that layer has the problem. So maybe like you don't even have real access or have paid attention to your base image, for example. This would allow you to see a problem in your base image that you weren't aware of. Well, too much of what's going on still, I'm sorry. Even though it's become very convenient in the fact that we're checking in containers, it's still turning into an idea of throwing it over the wall. And now there is now a real, real lack of trust of what's being thrown over the wall. Oh yeah, as there should be. Um, it's, this is, the problems we're seeing now, they've, 
the capability to do that, especially for those supply chain attacks, um, especially if you're using, you know, NPM, for example, um, any open registry or repository where anyone can put stuff in there, you're running this risk. And so many people, we just don't think about it because we don't have the criminal minds. We're just sitting there doing our job, getting our stuff out there. And uh, this, this problem has been around for a while. Um, with Artifactory, uh, this is good to mention, um, something to help prevent a supply chain attack, um, especially with uh, internal packages that you use internally that have no business being in a public repository. Um, and the way to prevent accidentally pulling something in from a public repository when you intended to get your local stuff, you can set up Artifactory in such a way that it will ignore anything that's public and only take your internal stuff. Well, that's the idea of the whitelist ideas of even images or base images. This is the whitelist Artifactory idea that you're actually putting here. And I think that's right. always been there since I think Artifactory came out, at least for most yep. companies I've dealt with. Yep. Um, just not, not enough people are using that feature to uh, protect themselves. This is an awesome conversation. I love getting into these, um, especially Java user groups. I feel like, you know, we actually get to learn something and I always come away learning something. It's really good. All right, Bruce, are we ready to do some I, I think so. raffles? Yeah, All right. No more Let me... uh, questions here from Melissa. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off this little record button. So please ask the host to give you permission to record. OK, so I just think I turned it off. <laughs> OK, and I'm making Ted the host. That's yes. correct. All right. Normally at this time we'd have a big round of applause, so I'll clap. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Ted, I see you. Yeah, I've got. Um, I've been taking notes here, so I've I've only got two entries so far for the raffle. So, do you just oh, and there's another one in. Uh, there's two more that just came in. We've got people that are very... Right, so if you would like to be in the raffle, what you should do is uh, put your name and email address in the chat box and message it to Ted so he can see it. And oh, is good. that Avatar? I think I just saw it pop up there. Sorry about that. You should have your ebook from last month. I was just a little delayed in getting it out. Yep, I think I received it. Yeah, that was my fault. I sent the uh, messages out right away. I just didn't see them come back right away. So they were just a little slow in getting them to manage it. Yep. I, think he, I think he did get his book. Yeah. As an, uh, sorry, whom should I send my e email? Oh, that would be to Ted. He's the guy here who's yeah to me to Ted Doyle. He's right next to me. Uh, in the, in I, the I can raise wave my guy, hands here. See him? He's waving his hands there. That's the guy to send to. I just put it in the chat window and just private message it to Ted. Must be present to win. And by the way, the speaker is eligible <laughs> to win a prize if it if it matters. Let's see. I'm just I, I'm trying to do this systematically so that I I and make sure I get every person exactly you know, once. I think what? as you're the host, you have to be the one to turn off that recording. It's oh, I'm okay. letting me shut it off. All right. You should have a record button probably down at the 